In today's video, we're going over a clinical examination of meniscus tears. Ooh. My name is Dan Pope. I'm a physical therapist and I'm a strength coach. We have helped to make thousands of incredible clinicians through our online courses, mentoring programs, and communities. The goal of today's video is to make you 1% better. All right, so meniscus tears can be a common injury in your athletic population. And one of the reasons why it's very important to have an accurate diagnosis is because it's going to dictate the plan of care moving forward. So essentially, if a patient comes in and you think they have an acute meniscus tear, that there's an opportunity to repair, we probably want to send back to the surgeon, getting some imaging, and then figure out the next steps. There are two main classifications of meniscus tears. You have acute tears and you have chronic tears. So the acute tears are exactly what they sound like. You have an athlete that was playing a field sport, they cut, they pivot, they may or may not feel a click, a pop, immediate pain afterwards, maybe they have some delayed swelling. You just created an acute meniscus tear. You also have chronic or degenerative tears. So these are going to be more gradual, occurring over the course of time. Usually they're in individuals that do a lot of, let's say, kneeling or squatting or lunging as part of some sort of physical career. And usually they're not all at once. Although sometimes you have an acute on chronic tear or someone already has some degenerative pathology, then they have a certain mechanism that creates an acute injury on top of what is already pre-existing. These degenerative tears are usually more common in older individuals. And the last thing patients with meniscus pathology may talk about are mechanical symptoms. So essentially these are things like locking or catching or big pops or clicks within the knee. And sometimes patients will present with what's called an objectively locked knee, which means that patient hobbles into the clinic, essentially their knee is stuck either bent or stuck straight, and they can't straighten it or they can't bend it whatsoever. And the idea is that sometimes when the meniscus tears, it creates some of these mechanical symptoms or can get stuck within the joint and can't actually move it the way you should. So first we wanna assess for any sort of swelling in the area or joint effusion. And essentially joint effusion is going to be swelling within the joint. And that can be common after a meniscus injury. So this is a sweep test or a stroke test. And what we do is we have the patient sitting, legs nice and straight, patient is relaxed. I'm gonna take my hand on the medial side of the joint. What I wanna do is start right underneath the joint line and sweep up a few times. So medial joint line to super patellar pouch, say somewhere between one and three repetitions. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to come to the lateral side of the joint, and I'm gonna go super patellar pouch, and I'm gonna sweep downwards, right? I'm looking for any sort of swelling that pops up on the medial side of the joint, right? So if I go up a few times here, and I come and I push right through here slightly, a positive test will be the presence of some sort of swelling on the medial side. And you can grade the amount of joint effusion as well. So a zero would essentially mean you go through the tire test and you don't notice anything whatsoever. If you have trace, you would notice there's a small bulb that comes up on the downstroke right through here. For one plus, on your downstroke, you can notice more of a larger bulb that goes away once you pass all the way down. For a score of two plus, when you go on your upstroke, you'll push the fluid out, but as soon as your hand passes the joint line, fluid comes right back through here. And a three plus essentially is you can't push the fluid out. There's too much and you can't actually get it to push to the lateral side of the joint. Next, we're gonna take a look at passive range of motion. So folks that have meniscus pathology often hurt with end range extension or end range flexion. Essentially, you have your patient lying down. What I'm going to do is have them relax as much as possible, fully extend the leg, give them a little bit of overpressure to force them into end range extension. Does that hurt at all, Gavin? She's feeling pretty good. Meniscus is good to go. And then what we'll do is we'll bend fully, just like so. We ask the same question. Does this bug you at all? Good. So no pain here, probably no meniscus pathology. And some clinical reasoning skills you can use if a patient has pain, more in extension, so force hyperextension. And the thought is they may have an injury to the anterior side of the joint. So if you look at my joint right through here, if I go into full knee extension, the front or the anterior portion of the meniscus is loaded. If I go into end range flexion here, the posterior side of the joint is loaded. So if you take your patient into end range flexion and bend the knee joint all the way, and there's pain, the reproduction of the patient's familiar symptoms, this would more indicate a posterior meniscus tear. And if you fully extend the knee, you create more symptoms here as opposed to end range flexion, this would potentially mean more of an anterior meniscus tear. Hey yo, I've got something for you. It is an evidence-based cheat sheet on meniscus pathology. And I get it, stay on top of literature for all the pathologies that are coming out. Very tough as a physical therapist. Well, 
I'm going to try to simplify it for you. I've taken all the relevant information about the meniscus and jammed it all together into a cheat sheet. And my promise to you is I'm going to catch you up to date on meniscus pathology in under 10 minutes. In the cheat sheet, we go over mechanisms of injury, prevalence, acute injuries versus chronic injuries, anatomy of the meniscus, examination, types of meniscus tears, surgery versus physical therapy, and some rehabilitation principles for you. So I'll leave a link in the show notes in the description below. This is 100% free. Go ahead and click on that link, download it, and get the learning. Now back to your video. Next thing we'll check for is joint line tenderness. So essentially, have our patient Gavin here, sitting, leg relaxed, I need to find the joint line. And I've drawn it right here in Sharpie, hopefully this comes out at some point for Gavin's sake. But when you're trying to find the joint line, what I do is I creep up the tibia, keep on going, keep on going, until I feel a dip off, right? That'll be your joint line, and then you pick up again with the femur. And you do exactly the same thing on the outside right through here. So I'm gonna try to go from the top, go down, until I feel like I hit the distal femur, keep going until there's a gap right over here. That would be the joint line, poke through here. Does this reproduce your familiar symptoms? All right, if it doesn't, that would be a negative test for meniscus pathology for joint line tenderness. When you're doing your palpation testing, just make sure you check underneath your patient's knee. And if by chance there's a phone there set to the fitness pain-free channel, make sure you give this video a like. McMurray's test. So a patient's gonna be lying on their back. I'm gonna swoop on in here and grab onto this leg. Now we're gonna go into end range flexion. And from here, I can either bias the inside or the outside of the joint. If I go into tibial internal rotation and add a varus force right through here, this stresses the lateral meniscus. And I'm gonna go from flexion to extension several times. And this reproduces a patient's familiar symptoms with or without, with or without a painful click or pop, that'd be a positive special test. Tibial external rotation with a valgus force for the medial side of the joint, and then tibial internal rotation with a varus force for the lateral side of the joint. Thessaly's test. So you have your patient in standing. We'll assess the left side. And what we wanna do is balance on one leg, and then from here, bend only about 20 degrees. Now the reason why we only do 20 degrees is because we don't really want to engage the patellofemoral joint, the quad, or the patellar tendon. So if someone's dealing with patellofemoral pain, we just have them squat really deep, you're gonna reproduce their normal pain. So the idea is minimal knee flexion. And from here, go ahead and reach both arms out just like so. And I'm gonna assist you into tibial internal rotation and external rotation. Let's go ahead and turn to your right here. Yep, and what you'll notice is we get rotation at the knee and then back towards me. Yep, and rotation in the other direction and then relax. A positive special test would be the reproduction of the patient's familiar symptoms with or without an audible clicker pop. We can also use the meniscus composite score to either rule in or rule out meniscus pathology. So essentially, if you have more of these things present, it's gonna increase the specificity of your diagnosis. The more things are gonna be negative, the better the sensitivity is, right? And that's going to be, one, a history of locking or catching within the knee, pain with forced hyperextension, pain with forced hyperflexion, positive joint line tenderness, and then a positive McMurray test. Next, let's talk about differential diagnosis. So, the thing is, if you have a meniscus tear, sometimes it looks a lot like other intra-articular pathology like an ACL tear or PCL tear, right? Both will have joint effusion, both sometimes hurt and end ranges of motion. So how do we differentiate between the two? So one of which is you can do some laxity testing. So let's look for the ACL first and use a classic Lachman's test. So essentially you have your patient, try to get them relaxed as much as possible. This is often really tough if they just had an acute injury, but the best you can, try to get them to relax. From here, I'm gonna grasp onto the femur with my top hand, bottom side hand is on the tibia. I'm gonna flex to 30 degrees, and I'm going to translate the tibia anteriorly. And I'm looking to make sure that there's an end feel that's similar to the other side without increased laxity, right? We also wanna check for the PCL. So essentially, we just go up into 90 degrees of knee flexion on both sides. I'm gonna check for a sag sign. So I'm going to feel on the uninvolved side, the distal femur, and then where it drops off onto the tibia. And essentially, I just compare that to the other side. And if they feel about the same, there's probably no sag sign. And after that, you can do a posterior drawer test, make sure you're pressing in line with the joint and see if there's any increased laxity on one side versus the other. And if it's exactly the same, PCL is good, ACL is good. I'm more ruling in meniscus pathology with my diagnosis. Another that I've been guilty of missing is going to be IT band pain that sometimes masquerades as a meniscus and sometimes these lateral meniscus injuries masquerade as IT band pain. 
So I had a patient at one point that had lateral knee pain, no swelling whatsoever, and lateral pain. And I was treating it like an IT band issue. But what ended up happening was he went back to the doctor and it was actually a reparable meniscus tear. He went on to have surgery. So the big differentiator for these folks is if I have pain on the side of my knee, it's right on the joint line, probably a little bit more meniscus in nature. If it's about two to three centimeters right above the joint line, right on the IT band, it's probably IT band pain. All right, so what is the key takeaway here? If you suspect someone has meniscus pathology, probably the best plan of action is to send them back to the doctor for some additional imaging. Big problem is that if you have an acute reparable meniscus tear, you don't send them in to the doctor to get a consult, you may miss that, you may not give them the best possible long-term outcome. So make sure if you're suspecting meniscus pathology, you're thinking about sending to the surgeon to get some more imaging. And now that you're an expert in diagnosing meniscus pathology, you still need to learn how to treat it. Well, Gavin, I have a video for us. It's in the corner. I want everyone to click on that link, and in that video, we go over the best treatments for folks that have meniscus pathology. Go ahead and click on that, and I'll see you in that video.